What does supportive parenting really mean in the teenage years? That's what we're going to be exploring in this week's episode of Pookie Ponders. Let's dive straight in. Today, we're unravelling the intricate dance of parenting during those tumultuous teenage years. Adolescence is a time of emotional turbulence, budding independence and evolving relationships. How can parents and carers best navigate this roller coaster ride whilst fostering a healthy and supportive environment for their teens? In this episode, we're going to explore practical ideas, loads of them, for effective communication, striking a balance between independence and responsibility, setting boundaries and resolving conflicts in a way that strengthens the parent-teen relationship. The teenage years are an emotional roller coaster. Adolescents experience a vast spectrum of feelings and it's not uncommon for them to oscillate from one extreme to another. Parents and carers need to understand the emotional landscape that their teens are navigating in order to offer appropriate support. Adolescents often experience intense mood swings and heightened sensitivity. They may become really easily upset or react strongly to what seems to us like minor events or swing from moments of joy to feelings of sadness and frustration. These emotional fluctuations can be attributed to the ongoing development of the brain, especially the prefrontal cortex, which governs emotional regulation. This area of the brain is still maturing during adolescence, contributing to the volatility of emotions. In fact, it's still maturing until about the age of 25. So there's lots of work for it to do here. Growing, changing, evolving. On top of all of this, teenagers are facing a multitude of challenges from academic stress and peer pressure to identity form formation, learning who they are. Understanding the factors that trigger these emotions is crucial. It enables us as parents, as carers, as other interested adults to provide empathy and guidance when our teenagers are struggling. Additionally, teens' emotional experiences can profoundly influence their mental health, so it's important for us to maintain open channels of communication to support their well-being too. But How can we, as parents, as carers, as other interested adults, effectively navigate these emotions, this maelstrom? Here are five practical ideas to help you provide the support that a teenager might need. So first of all, active listening. I harp on about listening all the time, but if we practice active listening whenever our teen wants to talk, giving our teen our full attention, closing all those open brain tabs and really being present in the conversation and making sure that we avoid any immediate judgment or advice, just listen actively. Next, Encourage journaling. Suggest keeping a journal to help your teenager to express their feelings. It can be a really safe outlet for their emotions. It might be a written journal, it might be a spoken journal or a video journal, but just finding this kind of regular outlet for their emotions. Mood check-ins is another thing we can try where we regularly ask our teen how they're feeling, creating a comfortable space for them to share their emotions with us. Sometimes it's easier over like text or by sitting side by side in the car rather than a sit down conversation that can feel quite intense. Next, think about healthy coping strategies. So encouraging our teenagers to develop healthy coping strategies to deal with those intense emotions and to help to work through them. This might include things like deep breathing exercises, mindfulness techniques, or physical activities like yoga or sports. These strategies can provide constructive outlets for emotional energy. And finally, family check-ins. So creating a routine for family check-ins where every member, including our teenager, shares the highs and lows of the week. This practice is not only going to promote open communication, but also allows your teenager to express their emotions within a really supportive environment. We're also able to role model the sharing of this kind of information too by doing it ourselves. So that gives us some ideas about this emotional roller coaster. But another thing we really need to acknowledge is that this kind of turbulent phase in our children's life also involves this really delicate balance between gaining independence and learning responsibilities. So this is a really sort of core dynamic of adolescence. Um, our teens are going to be striving to like assert their autonomy, explore new horizons and start to make decisions for themselves. But at the same time, 
They need to learn crucial life skills and understand the weight of their choices. It's big. So teenagers will really crave independence and they're going to yearn to break free from the constraints of childhood. This is normal. This is natural. This is part of maturation. They're going to seek to make choices, even if it means making mistakes along the way. This quest for autonomy is a natural part of their development and it represents a transition into adulthood. As parents, as carers, as other interested adults, we need to acknowledge and support this drive for independence. It's crucial and understand that it's a really vital aspect of our children's growth. But, but, this quest for independence must be accompanied by a parallel journey towards responsibility. Our teenagers need to learn that choices have got consequences. And this lesson is really pivotal for their future success. Balancing these two aspects can be really challenging. But it's essential for parents to guide their teenagers through the process. This means providing room for independence whilst ensuring that boundaries and expectations are really clear. We need to convey that responsibilities go hand in hand with privileges. Effective parenting during this phase is going to involve nurturing independence in a safe, supportive environment, encouraging decision making and problem solving, whilst simultaneously instilling a sense of responsibility. This is going to set the stage for our adolescents to thrive in the adult world. So how do we do this? What does this actually look like in practice? So a few things we can try. We can discuss decision making. So we can engage in discussions about making decisions, whether it's about curfews or academic choices, guiding our children through their choices, exploring them with them, discussing that decision making and considering the consequences of the choices that we make. Another thing we can do is explore budgeting skills. So teaching financial responsibility through budgeting exercises or through their allowance can help our children to learn the value of money. We might also think about healthy risks. So encouraging our teenagers to take calculated risks such as joining clubs or teams which are going to promote independence and social skills. We might explore volunteer opportunities. Um, we can suggest volunteer or part-time jobs to instill that sense of responsibility and give our teenagers a bit of a sense of independence. Um, and finally, looking at learning from our mistakes. Emphasising to our teens that making mistakes is part of learning and growing and encourage them to revisit and reflect on their mistakes just as we do as adults. We need to discuss what went wrong and how we might do things differently next time. Balancing independence with responsibility like this is, is a big part of our parenting, but it is just one aspect. So next we're going to think about communication. So what does effective communication look like between adults and our children during their teenage years? So our adolescents are often going to grapple with the complexity of their feelings and the many experiences that they're going through. They might find it really challenging to express themselves or even understand their emotions fully. And this is where effective communication becomes really crucial. So during the teenage years, the communication takes on a new level of importance, essentially. Um, as your teenager is navigating through this kind of transformation formative phase, um, they need to communicate with you about their evolving thoughts, emotions and experiences is going to grow significantly. The way that you engage in conversations with them can deeply impact on their development and the parent-child relationship. Now that sounds kind of blamey and scary. It's not. What I'm saying is there are little things that we can do in terms of our communication and creating that two-way dialogue that's going to make a big difference to your teen's development. So what does that actually look like? So first of all, active listening. Again, active listening. So practicing active listening anytime that our teenager wants to talk, giving them our full attention, avoiding that immediate judgment or advice, showing a genuine interest in what they have to say, even if the topic seems kind of trivial. This is going to reassure them that their thoughts and feelings feelings are valued and it creates that habit of talking and listening that means that when your teen has something that does seem big to the both of you to share that they're going to willingly do so. Next think about open-ended questions so encouraging meaningful conversations by asking open-ended questions instead of yes no queries you're going to use prompts that invite your teen to share more about their thoughts and feelings. This approach is going to help them to express themselves more deeply and provide more insight into their experiences. 
empathy and validation. So adolescents are going to face emotional challenges that might seem trivial or confusing. As a parent, it's essential, even when it seems this way, to offer empathy and validation. So even if you don't fully comprehend their emotions, acknowledging their feelings and helping them to name them and showing them that you care, regardless of whether you understand or not, can be really reassuring to them. Next, digital detox hours. So in this day and age, makes me feel old saying things like that, but, but you know, today, screen time can really hinder meaningful family interaction. So we might suggest a daily digital detox period when screens are put away, creating space for face-to-face -face conversations. This is going to really reinforce the importance of direct communication. You might get resistance with this, and it's really important to explore as a family whether it can work, but we tend to do this during meal times. This is the time when conversations can happen when our phones are not present uh, in our lives for a few minutes, a few times a day. And then finally, family meetings. I've spoken about these in other episodes and it sounds really formal, but actually we don't necessarily have to make it a formal thing, but to promote open and productive communication, actually kind of having regular times when you come together as a family where everyone gets a chance to speak, share their concerns and perhaps propose some solutions. These sort of slightly structured and really supportive times of coming together can create a bit of a platform where everyone's voice is going to be heard um, and family issues can be addressed together. A next big one as we're thinking about our teenagers striving for their independence and beginning to learn about responsibility is the setting of clear and constructive boundaries. So teenagers are often going to push against the boundaries that we set as their parents and this is a completely natural part of adolescent development as they strive for that independence. Again, all to do with the prefrontal cortex still developing. But but it's essential to maintain a balance. Boundaries are going to provide structure and guidance but they need not to be overly restricted. So they're there, the boundaries, to create this sense of safety and predictability for our teenagers, which is really important during these times of very significant change. Because whilst our teens are seeking autonomy, they're just big kids, really, and they do still require guidance and protection. They still need that safe base from which to explore the world that our little kids needed. And so as a parent, as a carer, as a guardian, as another interested adult, understanding the importance of balanced boundaries is going to be key to fostering our teenagers' growth and decision-making abilities. So effective boundary setting is going to involve really clear and consistent communication. We're going to need to make sure that our teenager understands the rules and the consequences and we're going to need to be consistent in enforcing them. But there should be some room for negotiation, particularly for your older teenagers. This is going to allow them to have a say in setting those boundaries, which can be a really valuable learning experience. It means they're more motivated to stick to them too. Boundaries should also be age appropriate. So younger teenagers might need more supervision and structure, but older ones should have increasing autonomy. After all, they're going to be out there on their own before too long. Gradually granting them more freedom can help our teens to develop more decision-making skills and a sense of responsibilities. So what's this going to look like in practice? I've got 10 ideas for boundaries that other families, when I explored this, told me worked well for them. So as discussed before, ideally boundaries should be explored and agreed with your teenager rather than just being dictated. So beware of setting boundaries that you wouldn't be happy to live by yourself. Um, your teen's going to learn a lot from your role modelling, whether it's good or bad. So where can we set some boundaries? What did other families say worked for them? So number one, one was curfew times. So establishing specific curfew times for your teenager based on their age and responsibilities. So for instance, you might have a curfew of nine o'clock on school nights and 11 o'clock at the weekends. Screen time limits. Screen time limits set for recreational activities like social media and video games can help to ensure that your teenager has time for homework and face-to-face -face interactions. Um, being clear about homework expectations, defining expectations for completing homework and studying, establishing a designated study area and a minimum daily study time. This is really great practice for us as adults as well, like having focused work time and then allowing other time to be blocked out for family or fun and so on. Um, and we can help our children to establish this from quite a young age, get into those really healthy habits. Uh, next was around chores and responsibilities. So um, some families said that they assigned age appropriate household chores and responsibilities and teaching their teen the importance of contributing to the family. 
Number five is around respecting privacy. Um, so we had lots of discussions around boundaries related to privacy. So things like knocking before entering the room and respecting our teen's personal space. So this is kind of a boundary of the parent, actually, and can be a really interesting one to explore with our teens. How much privacy should they be allowed? Uh, next, number six was around social media guidelines. So laying out guidelines for social media usage, including what's appropriate to share online and the importance of online safety. So this is stuff that our kids are going to be learning about at school, but it's really important that we have these conversations at home as well. It, it, it's, you know, it's a challenging world, the world of social media, and it's really easy for our kids to get wrong, um, particularly if they might act impulsively or can be led by other people and so on. So we need to be able to have really open, honest conversations. A tiny aside, when it comes to social media and the online world in particular, we need to create an environment where if our kids get it wrong, they can come to us, where they know that we're not going to fly off the handle and be angry with them, but rather we'll be curious and we'll help them and we'll be on their team. So trying to create that environment where they can ask questions, where they can come to us with their problems or if things go awry. Next, um, we spoke a bit when I was talking to other families about what worked for them in terms of boundaries about cars and car privileges. So if your teenager has access to a car. Oh, the idea of this terrifies me. Um, it will happen one day in my house, suddenly, with two at the same time. But anyway, if your teenager has access to a car, set some rules about responsible driving. Things like not using the phone while we're driving and respecting the traffic laws. Again, this sounds like it should just be a given, but these are things that are really worth revisiting with our teens. And also just worth noticing what you're role modeling in your car. Do you stick to the speed limit as you would hope that your child would? Do you not use your phone when you're driving as you would hope your child would not? If your child is not yet of driving age, then it might be a good time to start thinking about what are they observing you doing when you're driving? And would you be happy for them to copy how you drive? If you wouldn't want them driving like you do, then maybe it's time to just you know, a little bit of healthy challenge from Pookie here. Maybe it's time to have a little bit of a think about that. They will do what they see you do because you are their role model for good or for bad. Uh, number eight, when exploring with families, was about respectful communications. Um, so we talked a little bit about establishing boundaries for respectful communication within the family. So emphasising the importance of avoiding things like hurtful language or shouting uh, during disagreements came up uh, particularly strongly from a couple of families. Then we thought about peer relationships and the boundaries there. So encouraging open discussions about friendships and relationships and exploring with our children what behaviour is acceptable and what might be a red flag in terms of peer or romantic interactions. Um, we then went into some massive discussion about porn and how so many teenagers learn about relationships from porn and how this can mean that what they think is acceptable within a romantic relationship is so skewed from what we in our generation um, might have believed. And there's some really important discussions to have with our children now, even though they might feel rather awkward. Um, I would be really happy to do another podcast, particularly on that, if that's something that there is a desire for. So uh, do let me know. Drop me a line on social Social media if you would like uh, an episode along the lines of uh, discussing abuse, relationships, porn and so on with our teenagers. Um, and then finally, number 10 here was uh, personal safety. So in terms of thinking about boundaries, defining boundaries regarding personal safety, such as the importance of notifying us um, about uh, our, our teens, notifying us about their whereabouts when they're out with their friends or ensuring that their mobile phone is actually charged and operational when they're away from home and telling them this not in a this is what you must do kind of way but actually exploring and explaining why this matters how this is going to help to keep them safe um, and how actually when they're able to respect these boundaries make sure the phone is charged make sure they do let us know where they are that this means that we're likely to give them a little bit more free reign and increase the independence and autonomy that they're able to enjoy so we've set boundaries, but it's also going to be really important to create a generally supportive environment if our teens are going to thrive. So let's have a look about how this kind of comes together. So during adolescence, our teenagers, they're going to undergo significant
and emotional and psychological changes. They're going to grapple with their identity. They're going to grapple with relationships and loads of other stresses on them. So supportive parenting is going to really recognize these challenges and provide a bit of a like safe haven for our teens to explore their emotions and navigate the complexities of teenage life. Um, key to supportive parenting is going to be open, non-judgmental communication, as we've already kind of alluded to a couple of times today. Encouraging our teenagers to express their feelings, um, their thoughts and their concerns really matters. We're going to want to actively listen that phrase again and validate their emotions, even if we don't necessarily agree with their perspective. This is going to build trust and it's going to demonstrate that we respect their feelings, even if we don't always agree with them. It's going to be really important for us as parents to strike a balance between guidance and autonomy. Again, so our teens are going to need guidance, but they're going to require freedom to make choices and crucially to learn from their mistakes and experiences. Supportive parents are going to allow teenagers to take age appropriate risks whilst providing that safety net. They know they can always come back to us and we will help them if there's a problem or they need a place of safety. Supportive parenting also is going to involve setting aside quality time to connect with your teenager. This is going to be through like shared activities, family meals or one-to-one -one conversations, whatever works for you and your family. These interactions are going to help to form that really strong parent-child bond and create opportunities for meaningful discussions where they're needed. So what's this going to look like? You might have like designated talk time set aside a specific time each week for open discussions with your teen um, where you can share your thoughts, your concerns, your experiences. What I would often do here is just think about if there's a moment in the week where this could naturally happen, like do you walk the dog together on a Saturday morning? morning or are you driving your kid to football practice on a Wednesday afternoon if there's a time when it's you and your child together and there's a kind of captive audience there this might be a really good moment to get in the habit of opening those conversations and having that designated talk time empathy building activities so you might engage in activities um, that are going to promote empathy so like watching a film together and discussing the characters emotions and feelings and actions helping our team to begin to explore things from different perspectives um, we might think about personal space and independence. Um, so creating a balance between family time and our child's personal space, recognising that our child is going to want to start to pull away at this time. Perhaps we might allow our teens to create their own safe space by having a bit more say in things like how they decorate their room, um, giving them a bit of sort of ownership and autonomy over that space, making it feel safer, making it feel more like them. We're going to also encourage their decision making. So supporting our teenager in making decisions about their life. This might include choices about things like the subjects they're going to study or the extracurricular activities they're going to engage in or the clothes they're going to wear or what outings we're going to do as a family. Just helping them to begin to really be an active member in making decisions and weighing up pros and cons is going to help their decision making skills and help them get more invested in the things that they and we are doing. And then finally, you might create some quality time rituals to create that feeling of safety. So having like little rituals like, I don't know, weekly family movie night or preparing a meal together on a certain day or going for an outing at the weekend. or It doesn't really matter. It's like what feels good for you as a family. And sometimes looking back and seeing what felt good when they were younger that they might still be happy to indulge in as long as their mates can't see can create, again, those opportunities for sort of bonding and meaningful discussions. And then as we come to a close, we are going to just think about conflict resolution um, because we're thinking about teenagers and how to parent them today. And conflicts do naturally arise during adolescence because our teenagers are striving for greater independence and autonomy. Um, these disagreements can encompass various issues like their curfews or their chores or their personal boundaries. And how we manage these conflicts is going to really impact on our parent-teen relationship. So one critical element in resolving conflicts with teenagers is, you guessed it, active listening. Taking the time to understand our teenager's perspective and acknowledging their feelings and needs really matters. It demonstrates respect, it demonstrates empathy, even if we don't agree with their point of view. It's a, it's a real cornerstone for effective conflict resolution. Problem solving together can also be really effective in terms of addressing conflicts if you can move to this space. So encouraging your teenager to offer solutions for the conflict and to actually try and work collaboratively to find some common ground. This approach isn't 
only going to resolve the immediate issue, but it also teaches really, really important conflict resolution skills that they can use, not just at home, but in all other areas of their life ongoing. Choosing the right time to discuss conflicts is also going to be essential. So we shouldn't be discussing contentious matters in the heat of the moment, but instead we want to plan a calm, private discussion where we can express ourselves without distractions. um, And this will make the whole process more effective. And finally, we need to make sure that we maintain respect during any kind of conflict. So it's really easy for emotions to run really high and we end up with like loud voices and heated arguments. But practicing respect by using polite language if we can and using a polite tone is going to make this safe space for resolving disputes and strengthening those relationships. We have to just remind ourselves sometimes that we are the adult and we're also the role model. So a few things that can help in terms of resolving conflict. So having a a designated conflict resolution space. Um, Now, this sounds odd, but actually having like a a specific kind of neutral space in your home that you would go to where we can calmly and privately discuss conflict. There's going to be no distractions. This is going to really help with things. So this means not being in a space that feels particularly ours or particularly our child's, but that more neutral space um, so that we can begin to work things through. You don't have to label it. You don't need a big sign on the door saying conflict resolution space, but maybe just have in mind, is there a space in your home that does feel more neutral, that is a little bit more private, where perhaps you can go to? It might be that you go outside is also another really good option here. Um, Conflict resolution journals. So I'm a massive fan of journaling and for some kids it works really well. So conflict resolution journals for both you um, and your teenager, where like if there's big stuff going on and you're not quite at the point where you can talk it out appropriately, we might write or draw about it. Um, and explore those feelings and actually begin to look at potential solutions as well. And then actually at a time of a little bit more calm, coming together and reviewing and discussing these together. This can work a little bit better sometimes than trying to talk because sometimes emotions get heightened and we find ourselves jumping in. But when you've thought about it ahead and you've journaled about it and you've written stuff down, then we've got like a structure that we can keep kind of coming back to and revisiting, um, which, yeah, I found can be really, really helpful. The thing is thinking about use of things like emojis. So emoji express conflict resolution. So in like the digital age that we find ourselves in, um, you might find that conflict resolution via things like text or SMS conversations can work really well using things like emojis. So when conflicts arise and both you and your teenagers can then like express your feelings and perspectives using emojis, if this is a language that that feels good and comfortable for you, works in our house um, via a text chat. The thing with emojis so they make it a little bit easier to convey emotions um, without the pressure of those like face-to-face discussions um, and it's going to allow you to discuss the conflict kind of relatively calmly and with a little bit of space because text conversations just naturally just happen over a little period of time which allows things to calm down a little bit so we can take it at our own pace it's basically like a modern twist on conflict resolution that, that might work well you know try it see if it works Um, and we might find that our teenagers are a little bit more comfortable with that than sitting down and having a more formal feeling discussion and then finally like I think it's important to think about kind of conflict debriefs. And again, we don't need to label and name these. um, But once a conflict has been resolved and we've moved on and things are calm, actually sitting down with our teenager to reflect back and debrief on what happened there, discuss like what worked here, what we could do differently, and, and actually just try to have a really grown up conversation about it so that we can plan ahead for the future. This can work really well and actually shows great respect for our teenagers and again teaches them some great skills for life. So in this episode of Pookie Ponders we have ventured into the world of parenting during the teenage years. It's a time of emotional roller coasterness for our teens as they navigate this massive spectrum of feelings and big mood swings and heightened sensitivity. So we've looked at practical ideas for helping our teens cope with that including things like active listening, journaling and promoting healthy coping strategies. By providing this kind of support, we're not only helping them through the challenges, but also creating opportunities for really meaningful connections between us and them. We also explored the delicate balance between independence and responsibility that teens seek during adolescence, encouraging them to make decisions, take healthy risks and learn from their mistakes while instilling the importance of responsibility as a pivotal aspect of their growth. We also discussed the significance of effective communication, setting boundaries and conflict resolution in parent-teen relationships. 
relationships. This is all different elements that are going to help us building blocks for a positive and supportive environment in our homes. So as we conclude, I would encourage you to see these years not just as a time of great challenge, but also as a time of great possibility and growth. Parenting through adolescence is an incredible journey might not feel like it every day, but it really is an incredible journey filled with opportunities for both you and your teenager to learn and thrive. Your support and understanding are invaluable in helping them to evolve into confident, responsible adults. I really hope there were some helpful ideas in here for you. If you liked what you heard today, please like and subscribe and share my work. You can support my work further if you wish to by joining me over on Patreon, where you get early access to my resources and the chance to influence what I work on next. Or you can invite me to speak at your next event or in your setting, either virtually or face to face. Thank you so much for listening and for everything that you are doing for our children and young people. This has been Pookie Ponders with me, Pookie Knightsmith. Until next time, stay curious, stay compassionate and keep pondering. Over and out. Mm-hmm.